God, laying your majesty aside. You reach down in love to show me life. Lifted from darkness into light. Oh, King for a slave, trading your righteousness for shame. Despite all my pride and foolish ways Caught in your infinite embrace oh, And I find myself here on my knees again Caught up in grace like an avalanche Nothing compares to this love, love, love burning in my heart. Psalm 127, I think, is, is one that is a great summary of where it talks about how unless the Lord builds the house, the laborer labors in vain, the nightmen watch in vain. Children are a blessing from God, a heritage from him. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. Looking at that psalm, looking at what, what God is talking about, building the house, the family, when we use contraception, we are taking God out of that process and trying to build that house ourselves. And that is something that that you could never have the the proper family that you're supposed to have if you try to take God out of that. It's 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 so important for us to understand that God is the creator of every single life. Every human being that has ever been conceived was created by God. And if if we think that God can make mistakes, then God ceases to be God. That, that, that's just not possible. There are no mistakes with God. And so why would we try to inject or, or interfere with what God would do. And, and and I think that that is something that, that is actually, again, it pushes God out. And it, 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 it takes our families to a place where it's about us and we separate ourselves from being under that blessing, from that heritage that God wants to give us. Um, that I think that word heritage is just so powerful when you think about it that children are the heritage of God. It, how could we ever not welcome God's heritage? It just makes no sense to me. Natural family planning, many women um, associate that with what the rhythm method used to be. So in the 70s, the 60s and 70s, they would use what was called the calendar method or the rhythm method. And that really only worked for women who had very regular cycles. So it was almost like a Russian roulette of um, will you get pregnant, will you not get pregnant. Um, the natural family planning that's available now is very science-based. It's, it's um, something that is medically proven to be just as effective and sometimes in some cases more effective than any contraceptive method. Um, and that's my goal in teaching uh, fertility education because most women don't know um, that they're only fertile for about 12 to 24 hours every month. 
um, men are fertile constantly, and unfortunately, um, the burden usually lies with the woman um, to protect herself against the male fertility. Um, and very often, it's the men who are trying to protect themselves w against what they think is female fertility. But since a woman is only fertile for such a short amount of time every month, um, fertility education is to empower a woman to take an active participation in her own reproductive health care. fertility education and medical management and it is a program of the World Youth Alliance started by Anna Halpin. She's the CEO of both the World Youth Alliance and the FEM um, project where they empower women and educate them about their bodies at a young, even starting as young as a teenager so that um, a woman could know herself in a better way than any doctor ever could. So it gives women the concrete um, charts and the concrete evidence of what they need when they go to a medical doctor. And very often the first question a doctor will ask a woman is, what are your symptoms? And for most women, they come in with um, very um, regular symptoms that most doctors say, okay, um, just take the birth control pill and it'll all go away. And so most women, they follow their doctor's instructions even at a very young age and um, they'll take these very high concentrations of hormones for many years, sometimes even decades, and they can um, really, in a sense, lose a lot of time, first of all, managing their health, but it also affects um, their attractions and it affects even who they marry. for a minute. In my book, Recall Abortion, I did a full chapter on uh, the birth control pill, uh, how bad it is. Uh, you know, the, the church's teachings are right because they're, they're, they're good, what's good for us, especially as women. Uh, you know, when you take the birth control pill, first of all, you're objectifying yourself and you're using sex as a re recreational tool. Uh, but in addition to that, you need to read. Take out that little package that's inside the, the birth control pills and read all the complications that can happen to you. 
if you take the pill, the physical damage that can happen, the risk of strokes, heart disease, all kinds of things. And what I did in my book, I went in depth in, I didn't talk about the church's teaching with the birth control pill. I talked about how it can damage you physically. Uh, and I think uh, if we present that uh, to young women, if they would really listen to the facts, like for example, the, the UN, the World Health Organization, which is a branch of the United Nations, declared that the chemicals in the birth control pill to be a group one carcinogen, meaning a cancer-causing agent. They did this all the way back in 1995, and they reaffirmed it in 2005. Now, this is not the Catholic Church. This is not a pro-life organization. This is the United Nations, the, the health department of the United Nations, declaring what's in the birth control pills could cause cancer. So why would you want to take that? Why? So, yes, the church's teaching is correct, but if you look at the pill of what it does to you physically, you shouldn't be taking it in the first place. And actually, women have died from taking birth control pills. For example, Yaz and Yasmin were the two most popular uh, ones they prescribe today. Uh, I was recently giving a talk, and a woman came up and later shared with me the story of her best friend's daughter. was away at college and went to the campus uh, physician. Uh, she had severe acne to see if they could prescribe something. Well, they prescribed Yasmin, the birth control pill, because, oh, this will help clear up your acne. Fill the prescription and start taking Yasmin. Three months later, she collapsed, okay, and was rushed with a massive stroke to the hospital. She laid in a coma for five years, and in January of 2014, she died. Now, I know statistically, by the information I did in research, that women die from Yas and Yasmin. But now I met an actual testimony. I think God allows those testimonies to come into my life so I can warn other people. Being a convert to Catholicism, uh, even before I was Catholic, for for so many years, I I understood that the contraceptive mentality was something that destroys families. Um, I, I knew as a Protestant that contraceptive uh, it was a kind of a joke in in my church before I was married. That that's the that's that guy that doesn't believe in contraception. Uh, but I, I was very adamant about about spreading this message that it it puts a separation between uh, a couple and God. Um, it, it, it takes God away from the bedroom, and it, and it, and it creates a, a very selfish uh, mentality. Um, and then that also leads to th this culture of death, when, when it's all about ourselves and just things for our pleasure instead of uh, what God created. I think, too, we have, unfortunately for many years, I think that there's been this... this fear of talking about sex, fear of talking about something that's beautiful and created by God for a certain purpose. And as we get back into talking about it through the proper way, through like the theology of the body, and uh, we can build a culture of life because it, it should be talked about in the proper context and taught to, to, to young people through this through this way. And that, that way, um, we're not going to have the the uh, rampant abuse of, of the marriage bed that, that we have today. Women who are contracepting, any kind of hormonal contraception, um, they're actually choosing um, to marry men who are what they call less evolutionary uh, desirable, which means they aren't going to be the types of men who are good fathers and role models and treating the woman with the respect that she deserves. Um, however, the women who are naturally fertile um, are more attracted to the men who are uh, more desirable and who would provide um, a better life uh, for them and their families. Um, and these studies uh, are done by various different people, and it has to do with the female hormones, the pheromones, 
which are um, pheromones are chemical messengers that we take in through the sense of smell. But you can't really smell them, they're just put out there by our fertility. Okay, so when you're a fertile person, even a man gives off these, these pheromones and it affects who you're attracted to. So when you're on hormonal contraception, which shuts your body down, you're not giving off those fertile pheromones. So it's, it's affecting who's attracted to you and who you're attracted to. So um, they've done even long-term studies in marriages where the genetic makeup um, is severely influenced. So it could actually affect the health of your children. Whereas if you were not contracepting when you were courting or um, looking to date, you would actually be attracted to men who were more genetically um, compatible with yourself and therefore producing healthier children. Um, but if you are contracepting and you're chemically making yourself pregnant, which is what the hormones do, they make your body um, chemically pregnant um, so that you're not supposed to ovulate. Uh, we all know that um, our fertility is so strong that nothing man-made can totally shut down your system as far as ovulation goes. And um, most women don't know that. They think that, well, if I'm on these hormones, at least I won't get pregnant. And for the most part, um, they're not told that they can have breakthrough ovulations at a very con constant rate um, and that pregnancies do occur. However, they don't know when they occur and the babies are spontaneously aborted. Um, and this has such negative um, consequences for the woman, for her body, um, such as the link to breast cancer and other um, very detrimental health issues, um, not just by taking the contraceptive, but, if, but experiencing this loss of pregnancy without really knowing that you're conceiving. So um, our fertility really plays an active role in who we are, um, the decisions we make about our future spouses, and the decisions we make about our children. Um, and unfortunately, science is just catching up um, to us and to the church and what she teaches about these very sacred and beautiful um, gifts that were given as male and female. Um, and science is more and more proving now that what the church has taught for so many decades is really the truth. And it gives Catholics a lot to celebrate and a lot to um, share as far as the good news goes about how we're, how we're made and how we're created and our fertility. Thinking about that, let's say if somebody who has their tubes tied or a vasectomy, um, you know, I actually know people that have that have had that process and who have since come to either return to the Lord or come to the Lord, um, and knowing that uh, they committed a grave mortal sin, um, but that's what that's what makes God so amazing is that when we come to realize that sin and we 
come to that sacrament of confession. Um, it, it's such a beautiful thing. If you think, because I, I, I look at the same terms of, of when I talk to someone who's had an abortion or when myself, I was a drug dealer. I was involved in so many horrific things. When you come to the sacrament of confession and when, when your sins are absolved, the Bible tells us um, that God throws our sins as far as the east is from the west. If, if you look at a globe and you take your finger and you go north, once you pass the north pole, you're going south. And once you pass the south pole, you're going north. But if you go east, you're always going east. And, and to think back back in the scriptures, before people even knew the world was round, God knew. And he said he throws our sins as far as the east is from the west. He says he washes us white as snow. Do we actually believe that? We need to understand and believe that. We need to accept that truth that when we are forgiven, it is gone. It does not exist anymore. And and I, I, I it's mind-blowing how much we, we keep that condemnation back on ourselves, you know? And I, I remember going before to and saying something like, oh, I did this again. And the, and the priest was like, what do you mean again? God doesn't, God doesn't know you did it before because you were absolved of that sin. Come to God fresh. And, and I think it's a, it's a beautiful thought. So yes, there is that, that, that we made a grave mistake and, it may not be physically irreversible, but it's very spiritually reversible through through the sacrament of confession, and, and that's one of the, another thing that makes the Catholic Church so beautiful is 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 that we have that sacrament, and that we can go to a priest and um, it, and if we're truly sorry, if we're truly you know, which that's what the Holy Spirit does, He convicts our hearts and and and. Uh, that it may be physically irreversible, but it's very spiritually reversible through confession. What the church presents is a gift that needs to be embraced and open. Um, the reason why no one is really embracing the gift is because I think they're not, um, they're not given an example really or a witness to the truth in their life where someone is educated enough to speak to them at their level and to really introduce to them the basic science that has to do with charting. So, of course, self-sacrifice is one of the issues um, that most people shy away from because maybe their life is difficult and we all have great demands on our time and our finances, but natural family planning and fertility education in itself is a lifelong gift. So if we don't learn it when we're young, it's not something that when we're 30 or 40 years old, we're going to want to embrace. Why? Because we don't know anything about it. And also because um, we've lived life a certain way, you know, so far, and nobody's ever taught us that there is a better way, that there is another way where um, we could actually embrace more of who we are and it will benefit our marriages and our spouses. So with the medical science that's happening now is a lot of men are realizing that what's best for my wife or what's best for um, my future spouse is to um, not give them these hormones and not to give them um, this chemical um, suppression of their very healthy reproductive system. But they also, at the same time, don't really realize the value of sacrifice. So if you're asked to sacrifice for, say, a few days or a week each month, that's something where a lot of people don't see the value of the gift of their marriage because before they're married, you're willing to sacrifice so much for your future spouse and you're willing to do almost anything to marry that person. But when you're already married, um, it's a shame, but many people don't see the value of that sacrifice and giving that time to your spouse where you have communication of you know the most important issues in your marriage and to really build your marriage around the other rather than around what's best for you. Um, and your needs in that marriage.
Peace like an avalanche Love 